Welcome to Fruity Knitting. This is episode 68. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. And we're particularly excited to share this episode with you. It's the last one for 2018 and we have a very special guest, June Hemmons Hyatt. Some of you will have her very comprehensive book on your bookshelf, The Principles of Knitting. And it's been on my mind actually to interview June for quite a while. So I was thrilled when she agreed. I'm really happy you're going to get to meet her and hear her story of writing the book. And we also take a look at some of the techniques that are in the book. And you're also going to meet another extraordinary woman from Tasmania, Australia, and that's Nan Bray from White Gum Wool. Nan is featuring in Meet the Shepherdess and her story of how she shepherds her flock for maximum health and well-being is really interesting. We're also featuring Thea Coleman in new releases. We've got exciting updates on all of our own projects. We're also going to be giving you a review of our best knits of 2019. So that's all coming up. It's good stuff. But we're going to start with Bring and Brag. Ta-da! <laughs> Do you remember that gorgeous green skein of yarn I showed you last episode? Well, now it's a gorgeous pair of green gloves. You're so <laughs> clever. <laughs> I'm very excited. They look really beautiful. Some of you will be following Tilly Trout on Instagram. Tilly used to also have a knitting podcast, and she's been making herself some beautiful gloves. And uh, she's been posting pictures on Instagram. And when I saw her gloves, I just knew that my gorgeous skein of green yarn had to be a pair of gorgeous green gloves. And Tilly is also actually a drawer. And she's been making herself a series of gloves in different colorways to go with her colored pencils, which is really hilarious. Yeah. And she's been posting these very enticing pictures. So the pattern is by Mary Garing and it also includes a fingerless version and it's written for a DK weight yarn and my yarn is the uh, from the Hillesvog fabric or mill in Norway and it's the Pelsul yarn from the the Pelsul sheep yeah. <laughs> no it's not a Pelsul sheep it's a combination well they're a sheep that's a cross between Gotland and the original Norwegian land race but it's, um, it's a very hard wearing kind of fleece. And the skein that I used was the Solier, which is the light fingering weight. And it was a 100 gram skein. And I had enough to hold it double and knit a pair of gloves out of. And I had this much left over. So that was good. There's a lot of, of yardage or, or meterage yeah. in and 100 And the design grams. was for DK, yeah? <laughs> the design was for, for DK, but I held my fingering weight okay. double, which is actually what DK is, double knit, right. double knitting weight. Yeah. So, but I've knitted it into a very tight fabric. And like I said, it's a hard wearing yarn anyway, but this is going to make it extra practical and hard wearing because... I do want to, these are very practical gloves. I want to wear them out in the rain, riding my bike in the snow with a dog, dirty dog lead that will be doing a bit of rubbing and I don't want them to ball up or, or wear out or have get holes in them. So they're purely practical and I think the yarn's perfect for that. They're also going to be super warm. Can you feel? Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I took Tilly's lead and I added cables on the on the ribbing. That's not in the pattern, but I thought hers looked so elegant and good like that. It just, just gives it that little extra bit. It's nice having this as all stocking stitch and then you've got some cables down here. So thank you, Tilly, for your great inspiration. Yes, so I'm super pleased with these and I, have to, I still have to say that although I love them and I'm so glad I've knitted them and I'm going to wear them, I didn't enjoy knitting them. Tilly really enjoyed knitting hers. It's got nothing to do with the pattern. It's just that knitting accessories doesn't hit the spot for me. But I didn't have anything else to knit. I've been waiting for my wool to arrive for my next big project. And since I had nothing else to knit, there was no excuse. So I just got to and knitted them. Yep. People have started posting their top nine knits for 2018 on Instagram and we thought since it is our last episode of the year that we'd give you a quick review of our top knits. So here it comes, the top nine from Fruity Knitting for 2018 and we're ordering by date of completion. Andrea. Yes, not by best garments. No. Because <laughs> number one is the Sam Free by Marie Wallen. You might remember I completed this I think in early April 
and it's a it's a great design. I love it. It's knitted in about a hundred shades of Jameson of, of Shetland. Um, well, actually, I think there's probably about sixteen, but it felt like a hundred shades. The yarn is a gorgeous yarn. It's what most people would call a bit scratchy, but rustic. <laughs> rustic is the term. But it, it, to be honest, but it doesn't bother me. I'm wearing it with um, bare arms underneath, but I always have my torso covered you know, with a top on underneath. But it does make it super well you know, uh, wearing. Yep. I originally knitted it thinking that I would only just wear it with my tweed skirts and sort of more dress, dressy up occasions. But I actually wear it hiking. I wear it, you know, with a backpack that's sort of doing some rubbing and it's there's no sign of pilling or anything like that. So I'm thrilled with that. Um, well, it's a very elegant design with the long ribbing, I find. Yeah, and the, and color, the ribbing down here. The colourway is really amazing, the way that all so many colours work together. Yeah, they just all melt in. So this yeah. was a really successful design. Very, very, very happy with it. And num garment number two is the Tswagios. I think it's Tswagios or Tswagios. I never, never. know how to say this, but it's uh, this lovely vintage Shetland hat from the Vintage Shetland Project, which was recently published by Susan Crawford earlier this year. And we interview Susan in episode 48, if you want to check out that interview, it's a really good one. So I've just told you how I don't like knitting accessories, but this actually was an exception for me. I did enjoy it, and it's probably for a few different reasons. First of all, it's just a classy, unusual piece. It's not like any other hat. It's a different shape. It looks very vintagey with these very vintage Shetland um, Ferrar motifs on it. The, the gauge is extremely fine. It makes it look like it's machine knitted. And that also gives it a, a really classy appeal. I'll stick it on so you can see. Yep. It's got a sort of lined um, Band. rim. Yep. It's also a fairly large project with uh, that fine gauge. Well, not really. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's huge, a pretty small hat yeah. when it comes down to it. But I, I just think it's a really unusual hat. So it's fun to make yourself an unusual looking special project. Yep. With the colours, the col this is typical um, colour combinations for vintage Shetland. So you've got the blue, the red, white and the gold. I just changed my... Um, colours to be all slightly more golden undertones. So even my blue is a cornflower blue. It's got more gold in it. And the red is, is a really warm red with a gold under uh, undertone to it. And my gold itself is, is less clear. It's more mucky. And the, the background colour is a sandy cream. So that's garment number two. Number two. Number three is the Welk, which I'm wearing right now. This is a design by Martin Story, um, vest, obviously, which I knitted. Coming in at number three. Um, the yarn is Langsund by Donna Smith, Shetland yarn in a natural grey, which I love. I really enjoyed having this. I think it fits really well, which is... It fits you beautifully on the thanks shoulders. Thanks to your support. And around the neck. Yeah. And the pattern. Martin yeah. Story does yeah. good patterns. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I love it. And it was. it's really good for the sort of in between seasons where it's not really quite cold, but it's not warm enough. So I enjoyed having it then. Um, one of the other products from this project was this little jumper for Jackie. Jack's so our dog. Jackie's our dog, yes. Um, so we can do father and dog. Um, man <laughs> and, master man, and hound. Master and hound. Matchy matchies. So you might remember Andrew knitted one of the, one of the pieces, the front or the back, up to the armholes yeah. and the gauge was too small. So we've That's turned right. it in. I knitted so a we salvaged it in a contrasting grey, a piece here and turn and and the neck and turned it into a a vest for him. And here's a picture of both of them wearing their matching vests very handsomely together. Yeah. So for garment number four, we absolutely have to include Madeline's cardigan because she did such a brilliant job of it. Here's a picture of her wearing it. Madeline was working on Gudrun Johnson's very popular Audrey and Ernst all through the summer and it ended up fitting her perfectly and yeah, it's a, a really successful garment. And I was talking to her the other day and she was wearing it and she says she's been wearing it almost every day and that she really loves it and she really needs more hand-knitted cardigans. I think she was hinting that yeah. I should be knitting them for her. Sounds like it. <laughs> Garment number five is the Zweig by Caitlin Hunter. Here it is here. I finished it, I think, in May. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, earlier this year. I'm very happy with it. I don't wear it so much now because it's getting colder and it's it's lightweight. The yarn is Eden Cottage yarns, um, the, the, the blue colour. The gold is a Sandness garn, which is Norwegian brand, and it's a, a lovely mix of alpaca and silk. And it's a, I love the colour, it's very beautiful. You might remember that originally I bought some really gorgeous speckled yarn to do the colour work on the yoke with, but I didn't get the contrast strong enough, so it was a total failure. So I had to bring in this gold yarn, but that's very successful, very happy with it. Project number six is Harten by Kim Hargraves. And that is this gorgeous little summer bolero cabled uh, jacket. It's got three quarter length sleeves with sort of like a little ruffle on the edge, you might remember. It's got no buttons on it. The yarn is the Soft Yak, Rowan Soft Yak, which is also really hard wearing. It knits up really well into the cables and, and looks really good over time. And you can see that the shaping of the, of the jacket, the waist shaping is done in between the cables and that looks really, that gives it a special design feature. Number seven is the Carbeth, which is of course by Kate Davies. I knitted this up for Madeline. There was a little bit of tension around this, this object, this finished object, because Andrea would have liked to have had it as well. Definitely. <laughs> but it did go to Madeline and Madeline has enjoyed it. That was an Aaron Waite yarn from Fleece and Harmony who are in Prince Edward Island. We actually featured them on the show in Meet the Shepherdess back in episode 55. They were our very first shepherdesses on the show. And the colour is just out of this world, isn't it? It's so bright. We put the zip in and I think it looks yep. so 60s. I love it. It's I think a very the cool colourway, design. yeah, the colourway I think is um, Devil's Paintbrush. Yep. Project number eight is More by Nora Gone, which I've uh, finished more recently, you might remember. It's knitted in the Mayak DK in this lovely dark green with these beautiful cables all over it. This was a very successful knit. I love it. The yarn, as I've told you before, is fantastic. No peeling. I wear it all the time now. I wear it almost every day because I wear it over the top of other jumpers when it's getting really cold. So that was very successful. Number nine is my recently finished Aquila by Louisa Harding. And I showed you that I was wearing it last episode. It's a beautiful lace design in uh, Louisa Harding's own yarn. It's 100% cashmere, her ghillie yarn. And that was very successful, very easy knit, very beautiful. So that's our nine best knits for 2018. Bravo. <laughs> Coming up now is part one of our interview with June Hemmons Hyatt. We recorded this interview right around the American Thanksgiving holiday and we were very fortunate that June's son Jesse was in town and he handled the recording of the interview on their side. Whilst he was there, Jesse also took some wonderful footage of a hummingbird feeding in their backyard or so in the garden out the back. And we figured that since June had spent many years working and looking out onto this garden, that it would be great if we could include this footage. Exactly. So when I was um, editing it together and I was considering what kind of music I could put to accompany this beautiful hummingbird, I dug out a very old recording of me playing a piano recital when I was 20 years old. Now, I'm now 48 years old, so this video recording is 28 years old, It's and it's not digital, <laughs> but it is interesting. We thought you might enjoy it. I'm playing a piece of music called Oiseau Triste by Ravel, and that translates as sad birds. And you can hear in the music a lone bird singing a very sad tune before being joined in a chorus of other birds. And the music is stunning. It's very impressionistic. It's very evocative of bird sound and bird flight and sounds of the night. So coming up is a fantastic interview with June some beautiful footage of a stunning hummingbird. And you'll also get to see me, 20 years old, a, a young, young one, babe. a young babe, <laughs> in my former life as a musician. So we really hope you enjoy it all. Thank you. 
Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm very excited about today's interview because we're going to speak to the author of this massive knitting textbook, The Principles of Knitting. The author is June Hemmons Hyatt and creating this book has been the intense focus of her life for over 20 years. It took June eight years to write the first edition which came out in 1990 with around 30,000 copies. Seven years later it went out of print but the copies of the book were selling on eBay for between 400 and 600 American dollars. So finally June agreed to do a second and expanded edition which took her another 10 years and this second edition was published in 2012. June has a very academic background and was extremely dedicated to research and create a knitting textbook that would be as comprehensive as possible. I'm personally very grateful for her dedication and work. It's helped to raise knitting to a recognised status of high craftsmanship suitable for academic study. And of course, I love having it handy to dip into and cross-reference different techniques. And some of you will also have June's book on your bookshelf. So I think you're really going to enjoy getting to meet the woman behind this fantastic book. So June, it is so exciting to have you on Fruity Knitting. Thank you and welcome. Well, it's wonderful to be here, Andrea, and hello, Andrew. I think you're in the background. Um, I, I'm really honored that you invited me to come and talk about my book. Well, we're going to cover a lot of information in this interview, so we'll get straight into it. Can you tell us how you came to write the first edition of The Principles of Knitting and what was your intention for the book? Well, it was 1982. Um, I had just finished a degree in history at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, I considered going on for a PhD in history or going to law school, but my husband had an extremely busy career, a very demanding career. We had an eight-year-old son at home at the time, and I didn't think he needed two busy parents, that, not that busy. So I was looking for something I could work at home, and I considered maybe doing a book. I like to write. My professor says I wrote well, um, and writers work at home, which is a great advantage. Uh, I had learned to knit when I was maybe four or five years old. I remember my feet were sticking straight out on the sofa, um, so I must have been about that old. And I was an avid knitter until sometime in my mid-30s when I got busy with other things. And I remembered it was really good for th thinking. You know, you sit on your sofa and you're knitting and all kinds of things are running through your mind. And I missed knitting, and so here was an opportunity. I, I hadn't knit in so long, everything was in storage. So I took some stuff out of storage, and I sat down to knit and think about what to do with my life. Um, I actually hadn't knit in so long, I had forgotten a few techniques. And so I got out a couple of old books I had from the past, and I looked these things up, and they contradicted one another. Uh, one said to do it this way, and the other said to do it that way. And I thought, well, the rest is history. That was the seed for beginning the principles of knitting. Um, I thought, well, maybe there's a place for a small knitting book on techniques. Um, you know, it would give me a chance to see if I liked writing. I, I understood it's kind of an odd occupation. It, it requires an enormous amount of solitude. Uh, you don't have colleagues. You don't have phone calls. You don't go to lunch meetings. Um, and it requires a great deal of self-discipline. You have to get up in the morning, have your coffee, go upstairs and go to work, and you have to keep at it for a very long time before you even know whether the thing is going to be successful or not. 
Um, and so I thought, well, I'll give myself a year and see what happens. Uh, at the end of the year, I had an outline, a complete outline. I had written an introduction and two sample chapters. And I thought, well, this could take a little bit longer than I expected. Maybe I better find out whether anybody's interested before I invest any more time in it. So I happened to have, there was a cookbook author we knew, and I asked her and told her what I was doing. And she said, I'm going to give you the name of my literary agent in New York City. And so I said, oh, thank you very much. And I sent the material off. I didn't even know that this was a significant literary agent. Uh, I was just too naive. Um, so I sent her the material and she called up and said, I would like to represent you. And I said, well, fine, thank you very much. And three months later, she sold the book to Simon & Schuster. And I thought, well, this was very unexpected. I did not expect to have this go to that level. And suddenly the project was very serious. I had a legal contract to fulfill. And I told them at the time, I thought, oh, it might take me one or two years. Well, it was eight years that they had to be very patient with me. It, and when I was working on it, the, at first I worked part-time because my son was still young. And then I started working full-time. And for the last few years, I worked every waking hour and not enough sleep. And the result was 350,000 words. Um, this is the book. This is the first edition. Uh, you can see how thick it is. That was the one that came out in 1990. And in addition to 350,000 words, there are over 900 hand-drawn illustrations. Um, nobody saw what I was doing for seven years. I would go upstairs and go to work, and seven years it took before I actually showed it to the publisher. Um, so basically, I lived like a cloistered nun. <laughs> I, at the end, I thought maybe I'd forgotten my table manners. Anyhow, every now and then I would falter, and it was my husband who really kept me going. He, he is the great patron of the arts in this case, and he would keep me going. He said, no, 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 you keep going, you have to finish. So that's where it started. So what books did you use to start off the research? What knitting books did you have in your own knitting library at the time? I'm not exactly sure after all this time what books I had on my shelf. Um, I brought a stack here where you can see some of them back here. Um, these are all old ones that I had on my shelf at the time. Um, I certainly, I had all of Mary Thomas. Um, she's classic. You can't do anything without Mary Thomas. I had Barbara Abbey, um, all of Barbara Walker for the stitch techniques. I also had, um, over here, I had Monsey Stanley's book, The Knitter's Handbook. There were several editions, um, and I really relied on her. She was a remarkable knitter. She was a Catalonian and uh, wrote in English, so it was a second language. She lived in London. Uh, she had, it was really unfortunate she died young because she had so much more to contribute. But her book was sort of similar to what I had in mind, and I used that a lot. Basically, I bought every technique book I could find. Um, most of them are sort of like cookbooks. It's a collection of somebody's favorite recipes or whatever they could find. I bought a lot of regional uh, knitting books about knitting in, you know, knitting Gansies or whatever. I didn't buy uh, very many garment pattern books. That wasn't really what I was interested in. I was focused on the techniques. Uh, the bibliography for the second edition, uh, it has over 200 titles in it. So I eventually accumulated a great many books. Um, but all of them were simply basic instructions. There was no explanation about the technique, very little about how to use it even. And I wanted to know why. I wanted to know why something worked. I think I have basically, if you would say, a disobedient nature. Um, I never outgrew my childhood when every <laughs> sentence starts with why, right? So I, I really wanted to understand the structure. I wanted to understand how something behaved. I wanted to be able to compare one technique to another and know when it could be used in an optimum fashion. Um, and so all of these books I acquired were really a starting point. Uh, they told me what was out there, but they didn't tell me what I wanted to know. I had to then examine every technique and learn how it worked. Not just learn how to do it, but learn how it worked. Um, so basically, this is not a book of my favorite techniques. It's not a book that's intended to tell knitters what to do. 
It's uh, to give them the information I learned that I learned from the knitting so they can decide for themselves how they want it to work. Yeah, okay. So um, I actually want to uh, read out a quote from your blog because you've written quite extensively on your blog about your process, which I thought was was interesting. So you wrote, when I began working on the first edition of The Principles of Knitting in 1982, I pored over knitting books looking for techniques I should be included. I quickly realised I had seriously underestimated how deep and rich the craft of knitting was and how much I would need to learn in order to do it justice. So what are some examples of the areas in the knitting that you thought you'd really underestimated? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, it had never been done before uh, to analyze and explain. So I had to start from the beginning. Everything was new. Everything had not been looked at in this way before. It didn't exist. The whole craft had been underestimated, if you will. Uh, books like this had been done for weaving and maybe for machine knitting, but they hadn't really been done for hand knitting. And since knitting is a folk craft, there were a lot of different regional traditions. Many of them, they came out from areas where there might have one breed of sheep. Uh, they had one kind of yarn and one size needle. And they would develop a set of techniques that were suitable for the yarn they had to work with. And they made very good use of it, uh, but they might only make one or two items. Yeah. It was just a very limited set. So um, at the time, there was no internet. There were no, they didn't have books, they didn't have knitting stores, they didn't have patterns, they learned from their mother or an aunt. And for them, that was the way to knit. Um, and scholars wrote books about them, so I had many of those about the regional techniques. But I was working with all of these traditions, the entire world of knitting, and uh, I had to learn every technique that was in any of these books and literally put it under a microscope, if you will. It, I had to test and understand, I had to categorize, compare, and explain. And so I treated everything as if it was new. So the depth of knitting was the whole, the whole world of knitting. So there was a real strong element of practical research that went into this book as well. So can you just give us an example of that? Because you did mention that you had to set aside all of these preconceived ideas and um, test and compare every single technique. So just tell us about a couple of them. What you have to do is you have to hold all knowledge lightly, as if uh, ready to discard it if something new comes along. You can't say, I know how to do that and close your mind to whatever is new. And so even if I was uh, using, doing a technique that I'd known all my life, I had to look at it as if it was brand new. It's a very academic approach. Uh, everything analyzed, everything tested in the same way. I did nothing but knit swatches for years. I have actually a little example. This is only one bag of swatches, right? Wow. <laughs> there, are, there are other bags, and they're all, you know, just little swatches to test things. Um, I didn't knit sweaters. I knit swatches. So our cast-ons are a good example. It's easy to talk about how those were tested. So for each technique I would find, I would use the same yarn, the same needles, the same number of stitches, and I would do like a cast on edge, and then I would do it a stockinette, or I would do single rib, or I would do double rib, or a cable pattern, or a lace pattern. I wanted to know how that edge behaved under any kind of stitch pattern you might use. Some of them expand, some of them contract. They're all, they all behave a little differently, so what would this edge do under any pattern? And that was how I approached the whole book. It didn't matter if it was buttonholes or selvages or anything. Uh, all the stitch techniques, I would do the same process for all of them. Well, did you actually get to knit yourself a jumper in between? <laughs> well, actually, between books, <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> I'm, I'm wearing one, actually. This sweater is uh, 20 years old. So what was some of the most, or, or what was the most unusual or um, surprising technique that you came across when you were doing all the research? Well, there were quite a few, actually. Sometimes it was just a technique, but of the fabrics, twine knit and double fabrics were the ones that were very little known at the time I wrote the first volume, the first edition. Uh, it's an old Scandinavian technique. It forms a very dense, warm fabric. 
Uh, basically, you use two strands of yarn and you alternate one to each stitch. And for the first edition, the technique was a brand new discovery. Uh, archaeologists had found a mitten in a Swedish iron mine uh, that had been preserved. And uh, they analyzed it and they thought, well, this is not a kind of knitting we've ever seen before. I mean, knitters looked at it and they said, we've never seen this before. Later, they found it still being used in some rural villages in central Sweden. And I think they've since found it in Norway as well. And the curator at the museum in Stockholm that had this mitten, uh, a, a woman named Brigitte Dardanelle, wrote a little tiny book in Swedish. Um, this book here, uh, she wrote this book in Swedish. And okay. it came out in the 80s while I was working on the book. And so I could see from the illustrations how it was done. But I wasn't sure I really understood it because I couldn't read Swedish. Uh, fortunately, we went to uh, Sweden uh, not long not long before the book was published. I had very little time with this technique. And I met Brigitte, and she took me to the museum, into the archives, and I saw the mitten, which was really fun. Yeah, and she how wonderful. Yeah, it was wonderful. And she introduced me to a woman who lived on a little farm near Dalarna in Sweden, and, and she had been knitting this way all her life. And so I sat outside her house in the sunshine, and she taught me how to do it, which it was, you know, it's a very happy memory. So the other technique that was really interesting to me that was very little known at the time are what I call double fabrics. Some people call it double knitting, uh, but that's a term in the UK for uh, a method of knitting with two yarns. And so uh, I use the term that's known in the textile industry because the technique is also used in weaving. It's been known for hundreds of years, but it was very little known at the time. It's primarily known as a decorative technique. It makes a reversible pattern like uh, this one. Uh, this is uh, just exactly the same pattern on both sides, but one side is a color reversal of the other. Um, it also makes a little pocket in the center between the two fabrics, so this is another reversible pattern. I don't know if you can see it, but this little fleur de lis thing is, is stuffed, yeah. uh, which is kind of fun. <sighs> um, it is not a difficult technique, but it is rather slow to do, and some people find it a little challenging to learn. Um, and the written patterns are formidable. I'll show you one later. And so mostly it's only very simple patterns that were available at the time. It's a fascinating technique. Um, I spent a lot of time on it. So those were two that I thought were the most unusual in the 90s. They're all both better known now. Okay, and some of the techniques and applications in the book you actually developed or invented yourself. So can you just tell us quickly about a couple of those? Uh, I did develop a lot of new things in the book. Some of them are minor, some of them are significant. Um, in terms of particular techniques, I was really rather modest about claiming originality because you, you never know if something's been published and you never got the book. Uh, it could have been, you know, you missed it when you went through the book. It could be the book was in another language and you couldn't read it, like with Twine Knit. Um, so I was very, very cautious about that. But um, perhaps the most interesting of the new techniques that I, I know I invented uh, was double needle cast on. It's, it's based on a very common, the most common cast on, the one that almost everybody uses that makes a little half hitch at the baseline of all of the stitches along the edge. It, it, and some people call it an E-loop. It's just wrapped around the base of the stitches. It's only moderately stretchy, and I thought, you know, this is such a popular cast on. Is there some way I can improve how resilient it is? And double needle cast on really stretches. I have a couple of examples here. Um, it not only stretches, but it holds its shape over time. This, this is double needle cast on, and you can see how, how much it stretches. I'm not sure you can see that. Yeah, It's yeah. also really good for uh, scalloped edges. You know, a lot of times when you do like a shawl or something, you have this scalloped edge at the bottom. It cups, and the reason for that is that the cast on that you put on is only supposed to go this far, but the scallop goes all this distance. It could be twice as long as the fabric is wide. And That's so true. The, the cast on can't stretch that far. And so you get these little cups at the bottom and you can't even steam them out. This cast on follows the contour and it even has more stretch than that. Wow. It, it would go farther than you need for a scallop, right? And yeah. it's a very trim, neat little cast on. It, it, I can 
we'll give you a picture of it. It, it just lies nice and flat. Well, I'm definitely going to try that one out. I haven't tried that one out yet, but... <laughs> yeah, well, it the, the instructions in the book are a little daunting to some people. It looks complicated, so what you have to remember is that it's basically the same as doing the common half-hitch cast-on. It's just a slight variation, yeah. I'll figure it out. <laughs> um, so then the other thing I developed was uh, alternating cast-on. Um, it's a variation of something called stranded cast on. I think you might notice here that all of these uh, swatches, they have basically a drawstring in them. You see that? Yeah. And that is a stranded cast on. It's been known for a very, very long time. I use it on all my swatches. Um, some people use it when they want to pick up stitches on the edge, although it's not ideal for that. There are better ways to do that. It does work for that. Um, it's very easy to do, very fast. It's a backstage player. It's not something you would want to see on the edge of your garment or whatever. Um, and this alternating cast on is a variation. It's done in almost the same way. There's just one other step and that changes it totally. It's ideal for single rib. Uh, here again, you have the drawstring at the top uh, so that you can stretch something out as far as you need to go. And at the bottom, this is single rib, and it's as if there was no edge at all. It, the single rib just starts. There's no cast on edge. Um, and I figured that out by myself, but then later on, I found, after my book, the first edition was published, I found it in a book in, published in the 1970s, I think. Her name was Belle Myers, maybe. Um, but she simply had a little, uh, drawing or something in the instructions, and she didn't say what it was good for. She didn't say what to do with it. It was just there in the book. And so my innovation in this regard is to, to describe it, to explain it, and to show applications for it. I developed applications for it, not just for single rib, but there's also a way to use it, for instance, for it's a great edge for double fabrics. It's a great edge to use to make a hem. Um, it, it is, uh, there's a way to do it so that if you want to pick up stitches and go in the opposite direction, you can do this in such a way that you leave a circular knitting needle in that edge. And instead of having to pick up the stitches, you can just turn it upside down and start to knit. The needle is already there for you. So those are new applications of a technique that I didn't realize had already been done, but I did think of it myself. After the first book was published, um, with my, with my uh, alternating cast on, I'm sorry, with alternating cast on, I was talking to Amy Detchen. I'm sure many of you people know Amy Detchen. And she said, well, that's all very fine, June, but I want one for double rib, not for single rib. So I thought, hmm, maybe I can do something with this. So I did develop a version for uh, a double rib. It looks like this. It's still very elastic. It's not quite as elastic as the single rib version, but it looks very nice uh, under a double rib. And it's nice on both sides. And uh, so both of them are really nice for socks. Uh, anything where you have a double rib or single rib edge, the double needle cast on works for, I mean the alternating cast on works for both of them. Welcome back. We continue with our interview of June Hyatt at the end of the program where we're going to be talking more about her contribution, in particular in the area of double knitting, which is really interesting. You may have noticed in that last bit of footage that June was using a knitting belt and June is actually a really strong advocate of the use of knitting belts and her son Jesse, who is operating the camera, yeah. um, actually made some knitting belts himself, handcrafted leather yeah. belts in the past. Very beautiful ones. In fact, June has done a lot of study on the history of knitting and the use of knitting belts and knitting sheets in the past. So I think there's definitely enough really good material there to do another interview, which I hope to do. Uh -huh. So let's move on now to under construction and we'll check in with what you're doing. Start with me, yep. So this is, I have to show you the right side. This design doesn't have a name and the designer is Andrea. <laughs> Unimportant. So, yeah. 
So it's, um, I'm plodding along, I'm making reasonable progress. There was a little issue around here. There was a little a bit of ripping back because I didn't change needle size after my rib. So I just continued on and then Andrea objected and I had to take it back. So, but it's coming along. It's um, Jemison and Smith yarn that we bought when we were in Shetland. Aaron um, Waite. Aaron Waite yarn. It's moving along pretty quickly. I've done decreases and increases. It's all good. Yep. So after I'd finished my beautiful green gloves, my wool for my next big project still hadn't arrived. So I decided to unpick Andrew's neckline and redo it. <laughs> <laughs> I have officially finished knitting this jumper, but I decided to do it anyway because... It was just gaping a little bit to me. Sit up straight so we can have a look at my work. It was gaping just a little bit too much and I wasn't happy with it. So I unpicked the neckband and I decreased a whole lot more stitches around here first before redoing the neckband. And I, I'm much happier now because before it was kind of gaping out here yep. and I think it looks much better now. You don't notice a difference much, do you? Didn't worry me because I didn't see it. Yeah, yeah but, but yeah. I see it. So I'm not mad, but I had nothing else to do and I knew <laughs> that when my yarn did come from my new project, there's no way I would get around to doing that because that's just pure work. That's not much enjoyment to yep. finish that, but I'm pleased with that. So then finally my wool did arrive, which is very exciting, and I'm knitting, as I told you last week, Noragon's design, which is on the cover of the latest pom-pom issue here. It's called Nightingale. It's in a beautiful deep green. I'm not knitting it in deep green. The yarn that's recommended is the Quince and, Clo, the Quince and Co. Lark yarn. And I've never used that before and it's quite hard to get here in Germany. So I decided to just swatch with some leftover Hebridean three ply from Alice Darmore and I found that I got the exact gauge so here's my swatch here and so then I thought okay I'll I'll use her yarn so I sent off and ordered some and her yarn finally came and my color is very different it's a light color and you could probably describe this colour as a warm grey. Normally I would never wear grey. It doesn't suit me at all. But this is unusual colour grey. It's quite warm. It's called, the colourway is called Pebble Beach. And the fleece itself has been dyed and then carded. So you've got a hundreds of little specks, specks of colour throughout. You've, you can see blues and greens and golds and orange and purple and cream. So it really is like a shiny wet pebble on a beach that's reflecting the light, the sunshine. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, unusual colour. So I'm very happy with it. So here's my design, what I've done so far, if you can help me. Yep. Hold it. I'm knitting the, the second size. I would normally go for the first size, but I think this garment doesn't want to be too fitted and it looks really good if it's sort of slightly, a little bit oversized, it, then it's, it keeps its opulent character, which I really wanted. So you can see that I've done the band. It's knitted in pieces bottom up and already started with the, the cabling here. And this yarn looks really great with the cabling. I think you can see the stitch definition. You can see that there's some seed stitch in here, here, and here, and reverse stocking stitch in other panels. So I think it's gonna really show off well. I'm very happy with it, but I do have to tell you that I am going to unpick it. I'm gonna unpick it down to here. The reason being is this design doesn't have any pattern repeats in it on the cabling panel. It's about, it's got about, I think, 131 rows and every row is different and it's just one big pattern repeat of these uh, meandering cables going in and out in sort of an unusual design. So it's not an easy thing to add extra length to it if you need to. And although I knitted a swatch that came out perfectly and the pattern tells you to, to measure your gauge on stocking stitch and I've done that and it turned out perfectly here. My row gauge was 28 stitches for 10 centimeters. Here my row gauge is closer to 30 and that is a big difference. That means it's going to be something like between three and four centimeters too short. 
Now you can see that there's stocking stitch panels on either side, so that wouldn't affect where I put my armholes. You could put your armholes anywhere and that's not going to affect the pattern. It's not like you need your pattern on your sleeve to be connected at the, at the exact spot to the pattern on the body. The problem is that where would I put length? I could either put it down here or I could put it up around the collar. And if you have a look at the design, and here's a picture of the design, you can see that the cable panelings do a really nice shape that should really lie on your sternum and not lower than that. So if I was to elongate the last you know, add in about three or four centimetres right up around the neck. It would look a little bit bare here and a little bit odd. So it's better to put that length down the bottom, down, down here and do that crossover, this crossover cable here a little bit later. So that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm just considering that this section here is just a big swatch, which is sort of what you need to do when you're doing a design that the row gauge is extremely important and you don't have lots of repeats, so it's not just a matter of doing another repeat of the pattern. Yeah, so there you go. Unpicking is not such a bad thing. It's way better to do it now. That's another thing I wanna encourage you. Don't keep knitting hoping it's gonna work <laughs> out. Because if you do, then it's even harder. It becomes increasingly harder to unpick yep. if you keep knitting. So there we go. Coming up now is Thea Coleman in new releases. Thea releases her designs under the name Baby Cocktails. And many of you will know that Thea has a huge collection of very wearable and beautifully textured yeah. sweater designs. Thea's going to be showing us one of her latest designs right now, but we did want to let our patrons know that Thea is offering a 25% discount on three of her designs. That is Kalua, Fernet Branca and Widow's Kiss. Yeah, so they are three gorgeous sweater designs that she released this autumn. Two of them use worsted weight yarns and one uses Aran weight. So they're very quick knits with some beautiful textures and cables. Widow's Kiss would also be suitable for our cables and lace cowl, which we've recently started, because this cowl, at least 50% of the surface area has to be covered in cables or lace or both. So that's a really good candidate. And straight after Thea, you're going to meet Nan Bray, who is an exceptional shepherdess from Tasmania with a really interesting story. My name is Thea Coleman and I designed under the name Baby Cocktails. This is my sweater, The Widow's Kiss. The Widow's Kiss was inspired by this year's Rhinebeck Festival. For those of you who don't know about the New York State Sheep and Wolf Festival, it happens every October in upstate New York and it is a festival that celebrates local farms. Many designers design sweaters specific, specifically to wear this weekend or to launch this weekend. Um, and this was mine for this year's festival. Because it is a celebration of local farms, I really like working with farm yarn when I design a Rhinebeck sweater, and this year was no exception. Um, Callie and Michael Robertson own a farm in Red Hook, New York, which is only one town away from Rhinebeck, so that was really special. Um, and they have a flock that contains, uh, I'm going to remember this, uh, Romney, Icelandic, Gotland, and Finn sheep. And they combine the fleeces of all four breeds into this beautiful two-ply wool. Um, because it is a combination of these four rustic breeds, the wool has kind of a personality, which I love, but it makes it a little harder to, to work with sometimes because it's got this beautiful heather, it's got a really nice halo to it, and it's got a really rustic hand. This is my dream yarn but because yarn with a little bit of personality can get lost sometimes in some sort of busier patterns, I needed to design something that was gonna be really bold. I wanted to create a sweater where both the yarn and the pattern were gonna be able to come to the forefront. So these cables, they really did the trick. Um, they've got a lot of negative and positive space to them. They've got some really great bold lines and the cable crosses themselves are almost lifted off of the fabric. Um, both yarn and cable seem really kind of happy together here. And um, I, I really like the way it looked. I also love the way the cables end on the side here in the panel. 
This really beautiful flowing line shows up so nicely against the reverse stockinette background here. And um, when I design a sweater, I always like to leave a little room for people to modify things. So this panel not only serves this beautiful aesthetic purpose, but it allows people to add waist shaping or change the width of their uh, sweater if they like. The sweater itself is knit from the bottom up in the round. Both sleeves and body are knit separately. They're joined at the yoke and then they're knit to the top. Um, it looks like a traditional raglan seam here, but there is a little bit of a saddle at the very top, which I think allows for a nicer fit. And the yoke also contains my other favorite detail about this sweater, which is how the cables transition into this lovely two by two rib. Um, it makes for a really distinct upper yoke on both front and back. Um, the only other thing I'd like to point out about the sweater, if you notice, there's one single green stitch on the sleeve over here. This is part of a project that my friend Margot is doing to highlight rare diseases. Um, this one stitch is green in a sea of a thousand gray ones, and it, it stands out nicely. Um, if you want to learn more about that, you can look up her um, hashtag, the rare stitch. That's it. I'm Thea. This is the widow's kiss. <laughs>
watching her. She was eating very specifically. She ate the same plants in the same order, broadleaf plants first, and only when she got down to grass would she look up at me and go, you yeah, know, could we move now, please? So I knew there was something there. I didn't really know how to think about it or what to do with it until I came across the research of my mentor, who is a wonderful man by the name of Fred Provenza. He's a, now an emeritus professor at the University of Utah. Fred's research over many decades showed that animals, grazing animals that have both opportunity in terms of the variety of things they can eat and knowledge about what those plants do for them, those animals are able to maintain their health, to self-medicate, and generally to be much healthier animals. So the things that you need in order, the animals need in order for this to happen are they need opportunity, they need to, there needs to be diversity in the landscape, and there needs to be knowledge. And the knowledge comes from the mamas. The mamas teach their babies. And that process takes a couple of years. So weaning babies at three or four months, which is a conventional system, it just isn't going to work. It's not going to get you to the point that you need to be. So the very first thing I did was to uh, stop weaning and run all of my sheep together in a single flock so that mothers and babies and aunts and uncles and grandmothers and we're all in the same flock together. And then I also needed to help them all learn where the diversity is on the farm. But there is a fair bit of diversity in native pastures um, and what those plants do for them. And the main way that I did that was to begin what's called active shepherding, where I would take the animals, take the flock, to the different parts of the farm and hold them there and allow them to eat and, and just learn about what plants were there and what those plants do would do for them. That process, of course, also took a couple of years for the grown sheep to learn. And then, since then, uh, overall, the flock is now what I would call locally adapted to this farm. They really do know where to find things and what will work for them. There have been amazing side effects, side benefits to this process, which I wasn't expecting. They're certainly healthier. I have not needed to treat for intestinal parasites for the last 10 years since I started doing this. Their wool is, uh, has better tensile strength. It's longer. It still is fine as, as it was before. But generally, it's, uh, the characteristics of the wool are better for processing. And the animals are just overall healthier and happier being in an established social structure. So by the end of the second, nearing the second decade of my time as a farmer, I was finally happy with what was happening in terms of the production system. The landscape is beautifully diverse. It has to be in order to, for the sheep to be able to be this healthy. And that means that I've got a landscape that looks more like the landscape that I was hoping to have. So by, by this point, then, I was ready to start moving up the supply chain and looking at how to make something from the fiber that I could share with the rest of the world. So since about 2013, I've been having my fiber processed in New Zealand into, uh, I now have five different yarn weights, a DK, a fingering, a sock, which is a fingering which is reinforced for uh, better wear with nylon, 20% nylon. I have a sport weight, which is 30% tussa silk and 70% my fiber. And I have a boucle, which is a chunky yarn, and also a super chunky rope yarn, which is made by applying four of the boucle strands together. I have a total of 18 colors in the range, although not all colors in all weights. I'm going to move to show you what the whole color range is here behind me. This is the boucle in the middle. I do have three colors, which are commercially dyed multicolors. I sell online, and I also sell to shops and to independent hand dyers. And in fact, one of the things I'm wearing is something I made, which is made from a hand dyed skein uh, hand dyed by August Bird, and something I wear all the time on the farm. And then the jumper I'm wearing is made from the Silk Merino 5-ply sport and in the Coristone. 
It's been a wonderful journey for me the last 20 years, and uh, particularly getting to the point of having the yarn and being able to interact with customers who love the story as well as the quality of the yarn. And that's just so rewarding for me to know that there are people out there that actually care about the way I raise my sheep as well as the quality of fiber that my sheep grow. I have to say, it always tears at my heartstrings to see the Australian landscape. Uh, I, I'm not sure how it is for other people, but seeing gum trees like that and the open spaces really, really hits me. Um, I found it really interesting to hear about Nan's alternative approaches for dealing with her sheep's health um, and the rotational grazing. I find that this, this story of rotational grazing and um, plant diversity is showing up more and more, which is yeah. a, an interesting development. Yeah, she's an exceptional lady and it's a good story to listen to, yeah. And Nan is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 20% discount off everything in her online store. And as she said, she has a four-ply fingering weight, a five-ply silken merino, a DK merino, a four-ply sock yarn, a boucle and even a rope boucle, which is very interesting. And there's also tops and fleeces for spinning. And she wanted me to let you know that if you are ordering from outside of Australia, she has a flat rate of 12 American dollars for the US or 10 euros. So thank you very much to Nan. So we've now been working on fruity knitting for over two and a half years, just under three years, and it has been one amazing, overwhelming, stimulating, <laughs> extreme adventure, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, adventure it, is right, yes. It has been a completely all-encompassing <laughs> journey for us, hasn't yeah. it? The total focus of our lives for the last two and a half or nearly three years. It's been a great experience for us, but we do really need to assess where we're going from now on and primarily because it's a huge amount of work and I've been working on it seven days a week all of this time with very few days off. We've had a few days off over Christmas, even on our Christmas holidays, we're constantly preparing content and squeezing in extra interviews. So we do really need to assess what we can do from now on. But I did take some time to look over the content that we've produ produced over this time, just in the last couple of days. And we're really proud of it. It's been great to look back and just count what we've done and assess it. And we're really, really proud of it. And we have to say that every single episode that we've put out, we've done our very, very best work. You'll see that over time, the episodes have, have improved. That happens naturally as we learn to do things better and become more technically proficient. Yep. But we can definitely say that the care and the attention to detail has been our best effort from episode one right through to six, episode 68, and we're really proud of that. And looking back, we've done 71 highly researched, very well prepared interviews. And those interviews have been many, many of the top names in the knitting industry and on a whole variety of different topics. And we're very proud to have been able to put them out. So that's a lot, 71. And then we've done 44 Knitters of the World. So we've sh showcased either very talented but un totally unknown knitters from around the world or um, newer and up-and-coming designers that have got interesting passions and interesting slants on the knitting. And that has been a real joy for us to be able to showcase 44 of them. And then in our new releases segment is a chance for any designer of any level or experience to be able to show off their very latest work. And, and we've done that 14 times and 
and that they've been really good. Our yep. latest segment is Meet the Shepherdess, and that's been a chance to showcase small-scale shepherdesses who are producing yarn with a very interesting, very interesting yarn, but also a very interesting story. And we've been able to showcase six shepherdesses which has been great. And on top of that, I've done over 34 tutorials for you. So that is a ginormous amount of high quality, high, highly prepared and edited content for you. And if you think about what's typically available in a lot of magazines, you can think that we have put out the contents worth of many, 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 many <laughs> issues. And we're very proud of that. Yep. Yeah. And I also want to say that a lot of our guests, quite often on their own back, have come back and, and reported to us that being on our show has really significantly helped their business and they're very thankful for that. And that is something that's very pleasurable for us to hear. We are so excited to be able to support these small businesses and these interesting people who are creating really interesting things and just to support the knitting and industry in general. It's very important for us to put something out that's actually of use useful to the industry and useful mm -hmm. to people and, and of a high quality. But contrary to what people think, we this, this actually has to work for us financially. Fruity knitting has to work for us. And this is the, the slight problem area because contrary <laughs> to what people think, we get no money from YouTube. We get no money from advertising. And the sales that our guests make who come on the show we get no commissions from them and we're happy for that. We're happy that they do very well from coming out of the show. That really is exciting for us. We take no commissions at all because we want to stay neutral. We are totally reliant on patron support and it is way too much work for one person. It's not sustainable for me to keep going as it is. It's really important for us to be able to bring in somebody else to help and economically wise and time wise that really should be Andrew he has to be able to work on the show full time and there's so much work that could easily fill two people full time on the show and one of the reasons is and I do want to say this is that every time a guest agrees to come on the show I take that as a huge privilege and a huge um, commitment on my part I don't cut corners in any possible way I see it as my job to present them in the best possible way that I know how to. And that takes a lot of preparation beforehand, a lot of preparation during the interview or work during the interview, a lot of um, editing and sort of curating the interview afterwards and the support of the website so people can find them. That is, it's important for us to put out high quality when a guest comes on the show to do their very best for that guest every time they come on. And I take that very seriously. We don't cut any corners for that. We also spend a lot of time on the technical side of it because we value your viewing time. We, we want to make sure that you're having the best pleasurable experience and that means that the sound is good for you, that you're not up and down with the volume controls, that the lighting is good, all of these things. That takes a lot of e extra effort and time. So that's why it is really a full-time work for two people. And that's very possible if more of our viewers would become patrons. We do get new viewers writing, you know, making comments and sometimes writing to us and saying that they're really excited that they've found our program and that they've been going back and binge watching all the episodes. And that obviously is very, very flattering. And of course, we want people to be watching all of our episodes, but you have to realize you are watching hundreds of hours of our very, very best work hundreds of hours of it. It's not a hobby. We, it can't possibly be a hobby for us. Uh, so it has to be financially viable. And we do need Andrew to be able to, to be doing this full time with me. And as I said, it's possible if more people would become patrons. So if you do believe in paying makers fairly for what they're producing, for example, paying a designer fairly for a well-written pattern or paying a yarn producer fairly for a well-produced yarn, then please support us by paying fairly for well-produced and um, content and yeah. well-prepared content because that's what we're doing. We This is our product. So 
that's the end of the very heavy speech. It's a very important speech, but very heavy. But we do, first of all, I have to say thank you so much to all of our patrons. We, you're always forefront in our mind. Without you, the show wouldn't exist. You can take full credit for the show, and we are very grateful for you. But now it's time to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to be heading to Snowdonia in northern Wales for Christmas. Whilst we're in the UK, we're going to take advantage of that and do a couple of interviews, which is really fun. I always find it a bit of a treat to do interviews in person. Um, we are going to take a couple of days off. And so because of that, it will be three weeks before the next episode. Part two of June Hyatt interview is coming up now. So enjoy that. It is really interesting. Obviously, a fascinating woman with a lot of knowledge. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for being with us today and throughout the year this year. Um, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Goodbye. Bye. Double fabrics are another uh, technique that I took a lot of interest in. Most of the patterns are simple color reversals, like this one. You can see that it's the same pattern on both sides. This is just a color reversal. Yeah. Um, and this is another one. In this case, it's a light and dark pattern. But the center motif is, is stuffed because you can open up the fabric while you're working on it and put stuffing inside, and that's kind of fun. Um, but I, I knew that diff it was possible to do uh, different patterns on each side. Um, there's a picture in Monsey Stanley's book of a uh, suspender that's in a museum in Barcelona. It's this pattern here, and it has completely different patterns on either side. This was done hundreds of years ago. It's at a very fine yarn, more than 10 stitches to the inch. Uh, but there were no instructions that I could find for how to do this, how to put two different patterns on each side, so I had to figure it out. Uh, the written instructions for even a very simple pattern are so formidable that most people don't want to do them. Uh, you can see here there's a simple color reversal, and these are the instructions written out. So nobody's going to want to do that. Um, yeah. So yeah. I developed a method of charting these patterns, which is uh, really new. Um, it allows you to really see what the pattern is going to look like. It's easier to follow. Um, you can design your own um, uh, patterns quite easily. And um, it just makes it much easier to do even a complicated pattern. So that's a complete innovation, that charting method. Um, that must have, you must have felt really happy and proud of that. That's a real significant... It, um, yeah. Achievement it, it was, and contribution. Well, it was also really fun to do. It's like, you know, really figuring out a puzzle. Um, and so in terms of unlike patterns, here's one. You can see that there's like a little fleur-de-lis on this side and stripes on the other side. It's completely different on both sides. Um, there's another one here. It's got like a little brick pattern on one side, and on the other is a much larger motif. This one has a small motif on this side and two figures on the other side. Uh, this one has uh, two running men on one side and two dancing ladies on the other side. So these are a lot of fun and they're really, nobody would do these with written instructions. So the charting method is really, really helpful. Uh, the other thing about these is this uh, combines um, mo these fabrics are new fabrics. It combines motifs, uh, mosaic knitting from Barbara Walker's books with a double fabric technique. So they're really quite new. They have a very, very different fabric structure. You can see how stretchy they are. They're yeah. wonderful for like the edge uh, collar or the edge of a scarf or something like that. So those are really, really uh, new. And then when I was playing with that, I figured out a way to do a new single rib. Um, this ribbing here has um, uh, one round of double fabric technique and three rows of single rib. And what the double fabric row does is it creates a tiny tube and you can thread elastic through it. You can see uh, here's a needle inserted into the tube and you can't see the needle on either side of the fabric. It's completely closed. So if you okay. were working with a cotton or linen, 
uh, an inelastic fabric and you wanted a single rib cuff, this would be the way to do it. It's very stretchy. It holds its shape because of the double fabric technique. It will not stretch out of shape, and yet it's still very resilient. But that little tube is a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed inventing that one. That would be great as a waistband on a skirt or something. Exactly. You could tighten it up. So uh, I think the innovation in the book that I'm the proudest of, uh, the most innovative, is the entire chapter on stitch gauge. Uh, I frequently tell people when I give classes that if I had to take one chapter out of the book and throw the rest of the way, I would keep the chapter on stitch gauge. Uh, it's, it's a very, very innovative, it, it's an it, entirely new method of doing gauge. It's extremely accurate. It's very versatile. Um, you can use it for, all, it, it's adaptable to all kinds of different patterns or garments. And when I teach this, uh, it's just a revelation. People go, they had no idea. And the reason I think it's so important is because a lot, I think a lot of people give up on their knitting because nothing fits. Um, and this really solves the problem. It is completely accurate. Um, I had a sweater that I made and I didn't know exactly what the yardage was and I calculated it as close as I could, could and this was something like eight stitches to the inch and a big oversized sweater and I rechecked and rechecked using my stitch gauge method. I had already done the body and I was on the second sleeve and I started getting worried would I have enough and I recalculated again and proof of concept it said that I would have three quarters of a yard of yarn left, and I had 18 inches. So that was the proof. You know, I feel really confident in telling people that this is a very, very accurate method. And I think it's, I can highly recommend that anybody who knits should read my chapter on Stitch Gauge. Well, that's a, that's a really great tip to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about um, accreditation? Did you have problems and challenges organizing that? Um, accreditation is really complicated, especially in some place like knitting. I take it very, very seriously. Um, to me, it's absolutely essential that you credit the work of other people that you've relied on. Um, in an academic environment or a scientist, um, if you don't credit other people's work, you have a very short career. You're just gone. You cannot do that. Um, and, but to me, it's also it's an honor uh, to thank the teachers, to thank people, the books that I used in order to learn what I needed to learn. And for me, it's also a pleasure to mention other people's books. Um, I'm hoping that that will help keep them in print. Um, and in knitting, accreditation is uh, very complicated because you can't ever be sure you've seen every book. Uh, something might be in a different language. Uh, it might be a technique that somebody's grandmother or neighbor developed, but it was never published. You don't know how old it is. You don't know who did it first. So really, you can only accredit published material. It's the best you can do. And in order to do that, you've got to search and search and search the, all those 200 books. I would go through them repeatedly, looking, did I miss something? Is it here or is it older? And few people today, you know, most people aren't going to do that. They're not going to search like I did. People aren't scholarly like that. That was my job. I'm often not given credit for things that I did because they've become common knowledge. Um, you know, people put it on the, they learned it in class, they put it on the internet. Sometimes people have put things out there that I did and they put their names on it. They don't know it's in my book. Um, but what can you do? You know, I console myself that the whole point of writing the book was to give this information to knitters, and now it's out there. Well, you've set a really good example by really thoroughly trying to give as much accreditation as possible, and so I think that's a, a great example. Yeah, well, it was my pleasure. I think it's, it's exactly what a professional should do. Okay, so most published books that are like textbooks do get critiqued over time. So what have been some of the main uh, criticisms of your book and how would you respond? Yeah, well, the first edition was heavily criticized. I actually thought it was a failure. Um, I, after a few years, I put it away. I didn't look at it for eight years until it, people started becoming interested in it again. 
Um, the, I, I tried to understand what the reaction against it was. I think partly it was that I was completely unknown. I'd been hiding away in my office all those years. I hadn't been teaching. Nobody knew me. Um, and I think some teachers that were active then didn't like this newbie showing up on the scene with this great big definitive book on knitting, like who is she, which I understand. Um, and I think some had been teaching a technique which maybe I said didn't work quite the way they said it did. Um, and I think they probably felt contradicted or criticized. I sympathize with that. I think if you're teaching and a student raises their hand and said, but in principles of knitting, it says this other thing, that could be hard to take. Yeah. Um, and it was the beginning of the internet. There were these old listservs. Actually, Amy Detchen ran one for a long time. And people were beginning to learn how to be really opinionated and critical on the internet. It's much worse now. Um, yeah. And what I wrote uh, wasn't appreciated. Uh, people said I was opinionated, uh, that it was just a personal preference or something like that. And they didn't know that it was not opinion, it was conclusions based on rigorous research. Um, how would they know that? Uh, that they had just had books that were opinions. Um, they also said I was critical, which amused me no end because I aspire to critical thinking and hope I achieved it in the book. I was not being critical on a personal basis, I was doing critical thinking. Um, yeah. But I took these comments very seriously. Um, I thought, you know, why offend somebody if you want to give them this information? You don't want to turn them off. And so for the second edition, I didn't change the conclusions I had come to, what the knitting had taught me. Um, but I did try to be more tactful, if you will, more diplomatic in how I said something. I could see where there were times where I just looked opinionated, if you will. Um, I was also called wordy, and that's true. Writing is very easy for me. It just pours out. But also, I wasn't just writing instructions. I was writing explanations. And for explanations and comparisons, you need words for that. So yes, there are a lot of words in the book. And I know that all those words are just too much for some people. They just want the instructions and to go on with what they're going to knit. But there are simpler books out there for that. And not everybody wants a textbook. And this is a textbook. I didn't simplify the text. I, I needed to make things clear. I respect knitter's intelligence. I wrote, if you will, in a fairly elevated language. Maybe some people find that challenging. Um, I was criticized for changing the names of things, but you, people have to understand that there weren't names for things in the 1980s, uh, or the same technique would be called by two different names. So I had no choice. There was too many variations. I couldn't have, for instance, cast on number 34 and cast on number 35. It didn't tell anybody anything. Uh, long tail cast on was a big one that people got really upset about. Um, when I first started writing, most books had two cast ons. They had, uh, <laughs> Mary Thomas called it method one and method two. It was basically, you know, put an E loop on the needle or use the E loop on the bottom edge of the first row of stitches. Um, Barbara Walker, I think it was Barbara Walker, uh, that had, uh, let's see, it was Barbara Abbey had simple cast on and less simple cast on. I kid you not, yeah. that's in the book. Elizabeth Zimmerman was the first one to use the word long tail cast on for this particular cast on. But in a later book, she put it in lower case and quotes like she wasn't sure she wanted to call it that. Um, Barbara Walker, nine years later, was still using method one and method two. And so I thought, well, what am I going to do? I have to call yeah. this something. And I decided I would call it on the basis of the fabric structure because that was unique. And long tail cast on, I called it half hitch cast on because that's what's on the edge. I used the same names in the second edition that I used in the first edition that was published in 1990. Criticisms of the new book have really been minor. Um, I get a lot of praise and gratitude, which is very satisfying, especially given my sense of responsibility that you asked about. And it makes up for whatever I called long tail cast on. That's, that's the writer's dilemma. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so the book is massive in size and it's very comprehensive, which could, like you said, it could be a little bit overwhelming for some readers, but it certainly doesn't need to be. So 
Just to finish off, can you tell us um, how would you recommend knitters and designers use the book? And also, are there any uh, special tips or sections in the book that you think are particular gems? I know you've mentioned the, the gauge um, uh, subject as being, or chapter as being a real favourite of yours. Is there any other tips or, or sections that you would like to point out for readers? Well, it is big. Right, and there are a lot of words, so it can be daunting. People look at it and they, you know, roll their eyes. Do I really need that? It isn't a quick read. And because of its structure and because of my approach, it's not something you dip into like a cookbook and pick a chicken recipe. Um, so it, it requires a different approach than most of the other knitting technique books out there. Um, and so what I suggest is first that you do read the introduction to the second edition. There are suggestions in there for how to use the book. Some of it uh, for new knitters are very, very detailed ins instructions for how a new knitter should approach the book. And basically, I wrote the book for beginners because this book actually turns people like me, people who think they are advanced knitters, into beginners. I've had designers and teachers in my classes, and they are beginners at some technique or another. So um, I really had beginners in mind as I wrote everything. And so what I suggest is you look at each chapter, go through the book, just go through it quickly, look at each chapter so you know what's there, read the headings and the subheadings and maybe the first paragraph. And then if you're interested in a technique, you think, well, I really want to learn about this, then you dig it a little deeper. And if there are variations, you might read you know, the, more about the explanations of each one, and then pick the one you really think is going to be suitable for your project and do that one. Doing that means you're going to have a sense of what's in the book. And then for some other project, you can go back and say, I think that was in the book, and it's probably in this chapter here, and you learn something new. You, you don't, you're not going to learn the whole book. I know the whole book, but nobody else knows yeah. the whole book. You, you learn what is suitable for your kind yeah. of knitting and for your particular project. And if you have a, you've bought a purchased a garment pattern, I really, really recommend that you look up each technique that's going to be used in the project and see whether it's the optimum one to use. It may be the designer has picked one that you think is really going to work, but you might want to use something else. And you decide for yourself how to work. That's what the book is for, for you to decide for yourself. If you're going to design something and you have it in mind what you need to do, again, you look up each technique and pick the one that's right for that project. Decide for yourself how to work. Um, and like you said, stitch gauge is the only one that applies to everything you will do. Everything. Um, and that's the one that's the most important. So... Well, thank you. That is a very comprehensive answer. You've given us a really comprehensive journey, you know, and it, so we really <laughs> understand a lot more about what it took you to write this book, the hours and, and the dedication, like I said at yeah. the beginning, that you put into to really make sure that you were trying to cover everything in as much detail and yeah. um, objectively as possible, which I think I think is really great. So thank you so much for being so generous and, and spending time with us today. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay, well, we'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. Bye.